I have read in my earlier years about prisoners in the Revolutionary War and other wars. It sounded so noble and heroic to be a prisoner of war, and accounts of their adventures were quite romantic. But the romance has been knocked out of the prisoner of war business. It's a fraud. Sergeant John L. Ransom. Brother against brother. American against American. The American Civil War was a defining moment in history, not only for the battles won or lost or the advanced military tactics used, but it was also defining for the treatment of humanity within war situations. This war and the treatment of prisoners pushed the boundaries of the Articles of War and the moral compass of those in charge. One military prison in particular would result in the trial and execution of its commander due to the horrible conditions and treatment. In January of 1864, construction on Camp Sumter Military Prison commenced. Camp Sumter would become better known as Andersonville, one of the deadliest Civil War prisons. Andersonville was known as one of the most infamous prisons, both today and during the Civil War. Um, today what surrounds us is a 26-acre field. It seems barren as you look around. Back then, a population of almost 33,000 United States soldiers filled the hills uh, leading down to the creek. The area behind me, the North Gate, saw almost 45,000 United States soldiers pass through these gates, um, their fortune, their fate unknown uh, once they stood on these grounds. This also proves to be the deadliest landscape for a United States soldier, with 13,000 men losing their lives due to the various conditions that they will experience here. Also the intensity of Andersonville will set it apart historically and during the uh, Civil War. Uh, the intensity includes the fact that the acreage of the prison site at only 26 acres makes it a very compact and almost one of the most condensed prison sites, but also the high population held in just a simple 14 months. When scouting areas to build Camp Sumter, Andersonville, Georgia was thought to be an ideal location. A railroad went through the town, which made it easy to transport prisoners and supplies. It was also remote and had plenty of natural resources, such as timber to build the stockades and a stream to provide running water. With Andersonville being located in South Georgia, away from any combat, chances of Union forces coming to attack were unlikely. With its first occupants arriving in February of 1864 from Richmond, Virginia, Camp Sumter Military Prison would be seen as almost a paradise compared to the drafty, barrack-styled prison. Much of our prison site is also defined by the life of the war around it. Um, it is shaped, it is defined by a war that is long waged. Uh, three long years, by 1864, there is a necessity to have a prison site here. What has generally happened prior to that? A breakdown of exchange systems over the issue of African American soldiers in Union ranks. After that point, unable to reach an agreement uh, on both sides, that means that all men will be held, both in Union prison camps in the North and, of course, Confederate prisons across the South. Initially, prisons were in places such as warehouses, farms, even fields. As those places became overflowing with prisoners, especially in places such as Richmond, Virginia, they would then find other places to go. Andersonville, the land around us, is another place to go. Private Robert Knox Sneeden of the Union Army arrived at Andersonville shortly after it opened in late February of 1864. It is through his detailed memoirs and drawings that specific thorough descriptions of the conditions within the prison were made known to the American public after the war had ended. All of the prisoners who came here before we did were in half-starved, ragged, and dirty condition. All had tales of the horrible situation and brutal treatment. Sergeant John L. Ransom from Jackson, Michigan, was just 20 years old when he arrived at the prison on March 14, 1864. Like Sneeden, Ransom kept a detailed daily journal of his experience inside the stockade. Within the five months of being at Andersonville, Sergeant Ransom became ill with scurvy, made an unsuccessful escape attempt, and witnessed hundreds of men suffer until their death. They die now, like sheep fully a hundred each day. New prisoners come inside in squads of hundreds, and in a few weeks, all are dead. Conditions within the prison were gruesome. Over 100 Union soldiers died each day from scurvy, dysentery, starvation, murder, and even suicide. Shelter was not provided, which left men to makeshift tents out of clothing, canvas, sticks, and by digging into the ground. 
The stream that was to provide running water soon became contaminated by human waste. There is a thick green scum on the water. All who drink freely are made sick, and their faces swell up so they cannot see. Along with supplies for shelter and fresh water, food was scarce as well. Small portions of raw daily rations were distributed. Without any cooking utensils, canteens were split in half and used as pans to cook the cornmeal and meat. The meat was often infested with maggots or mold. The cornmeal was not much better. With the cob included in the grindings, the men could not digest it as well, which led to chronic diarrhea and dysentery. Another illness that plagued many of the soldiers was scurvy due to the lack of vegetables. The meal was very coarse. Out of this we made mush, or corn cakes, which were baked by the fires in tin pans which we had made ourselves, or in split canteens. Many corn cakes were upset and lost in the fire, while many were burnt hard and black as bricks. At only 44 years old, General William Sherman already had a full military career behind him. After graduating from West Point Military Academy in 1840, Sherman joined the Army as a second lieutenant and fought in the Second Seminole War in Florida. After the war, Sherman was stationed to oversee administrative military duties in Georgia and South Carolina. In the 1850s, he left military life to pursue civilian life and to be closer to his wife and eight children who lived in Ohio. After the attack on Fort Sumter in 1861, Sherman rejoined the Army against the wishes of his family. In 1864, General Ulysses Grant appointed General Sherman as a leader of the Atlanta and Savannah campaigns. Leading up to the campaigns, Sherman spent his days studying Georgia's economy, resources, and topography. He also learned how to run railroad systems and how to destroy them. His main goal was to show the Confederacy that their government was not strong enough to protect and provide for them. Our lines had advanced three miles northwest of Atlanta and within a mile and a half of Macon Road. Sherman is making gradual approaches and is very near the enemy works. In mid-July, during the Atlanta campaign, Major General George Stoneman of the Ohio Army, who marched in Sherman's right wing, was ordered to destroy Macon's railroads in order to cut off supplies going towards Atlanta, which is known in present day as Stoneman's Raid. At the raid's completion, he would then carry out a supplementary mission for which Stoneman had obtained Sherman's last-minute approval, the liberation of prisoners in Camp Oglethorpe, an officer's prison in Macon, and then of the thousands in Andersonville. Sherman allowed the liberation attempt in response to the hundreds of letters he received from family members of Union soldiers pleading for Sherman to free their loved ones. While making their way to Camp Oglethorpe in Macon, Stoneman and a band of about 700 troops were captured at the Battle of Sunshine Church in present-day Round Oak, Georgia, which is about 10 miles north of Macon. Stoneman was then sent to Camp Oglethorpe as a prisoner of war and was exchanged a few months later. You know, as Sherman is advancing to, to Atlanta, the Confederacy is trying to calculate where he's coming next and they're convinced his next objective will be Andersonville. General Sherman captured Elena on September 2, 1864, after one of the war's most brilliant campaigns, and six weeks later was to leave it behind ungarrisoned to lead his troops on a march that would bring him immortality. After the burning of Atlanta, Georgia on November 15th, Sherman and his 62,000 troops would set off on a journey towards Milledgeville, the capital of Georgia, and then on to Savannah in his effort to make Georgia howl during his Savannah campaign. The information received from Atlanta leaves no room to doubt that the city was evacuated by our forces early yesterday morning. The reeling stock of the railroads were destroyed before our forces left. The explosions heard were ensued by the ammunition and the cars which were destroyed. The campaign was effective in destroying major cities such as Elena, Milledgeville, and Savannah, and was ultimately effective in bringing the war to an end. By marching through the heart of the Confederacy, Sherman was able to cut off supplies to Confederate troops, gain control of railways, and weaken the already unstable Confederate nation. I propose to demonstrate the vulnerability of the South and make its inhabitants feel that war and individual ruin are synonymous terms. The destruction laid throughout Georgia was 80 miles wide. The army was split into two wings, the left wing going northeast and the right wing traveling southeast. 
they reunited in Georgia's capital, Milledgeville, and together made their way to Savannah. The right wing swung down as far south as Macon, which leads some to wonder why they did not go fifty miles further south and make a second attempt to liberate Andersonville prison. The liberation would have given them more manpower and would have truly shown the Confederacy that they could not withstand Union forces. Many of Sherman's troops, and even Sherman himself, knew of the conditions inside Andersonville through Private Sidney Moore, who escaped from the prison and relayed information to General Alexander McCook of Sherman's army. Our government must hear of our condition here and get us away before long. If they don't, it's a poor government to tie to. General John Bell Hood of the Confederate Army wanted to negotiate a prisoner exchange with Sherman concerning the men in Andersonville. Sherman refused to exchange Confederate prisoners for Union prisoners held at Andersonville because he knew of the pitiable conditions of Federal prisoners there, and they would have to be sent home due to their inability to fight in his army. Sherman knew of the horrors of war and did not try to hide from them. During an encounter with Confederate troops, many of his men were injured. When leaving the area, Sherman asked that they be treated by Dr. Massey, the Confederate doctor on site. If they die, give them a decent burial. If they live, send them to Andersonville, of course. They are prisoners of war. What else can you do? If I had your men, I would send them to prison. Evacuations of Andersonville began in September of 1864 with the news that Sherman occupied Atlanta, Georgia. Evacuation order happened somewhere between probably September 3rd and September 5th. By the 7th of September, the trains are pulling hundreds of prisoners out at a time and in the space of, five, of, of a week, the prison population drops from you know, 31,000 to 13,000. Once the right wing of Sherman's army began to advance towards Macon, major evacuations took place to ensure that an attack by Union forces on the prison would not liberate the prisoners. Many of the prisoners who were evacuated between September and October were relocated to a prison in Savannah, Georgia. In October, prisoners were being sent to a newly completed prison in Millen, Georgia, called Camp Lawton. By the time Sherman's army made it to the outskirts of Macon, only 200 prisoners were left inside the stockade walls of Andersonville. In August, the, after a summer of searching sites in Alabama, the, in the prison command under General Winder begins construction of a new prison in East Georgia in what becomes Camp Lawton. And Camp Lawton is intended in many respects not to relieve Andersonville, but to replace it. And again, that's, that's based on the fear that Andersonville is, is going to be targeted by Sherman. Camp Lawton was a 42-acre stockade. Compared to Andersonville, the new camp was in Eden. Water and food supplies were better, as well as the prison commandant. When warning came around that Andersonville was vulnerable for an attack, some 10,000 prisoners were transferred to Camp Lawton. One of those 10,000 was Private Robert Sneeden, who arrived on October 16th. This is the best camp any of us have yet been in, as far as plenty of room, good water, and regular rations go. And the captain says he would give us more if he had them, and supplies have been prevented from coming to the station because the Yankees have destroyed the railroad. After over one month of operation, on November 19th, prisoners were beginning to be evacuated from Camp Lawton and transferred to Savannah due to Sherman's approaching army. On November 23rd, Union General Hugh Compatrick took it upon himself to follow through with a special mission to liberate the prison while he was just five miles south of Millen. By the time he arrived, the prison was empty. One soldier of Kilpatrick's regiment had a brother who was imprisoned at Andersonville. In hopes that he was one of the many moved to Camp Lawton, he ran to the gates and rushed inside to search for his brother. All he found was a few unconscious prisoners left behind to die and some wooden and bone spoons he picked up as relics. Kilpatrick and his men proceeded to burn down the prison and the fort surrounding it. Once General Sherman captured Savannah in December, Andersonville once again repopulated. The prison in December is a dramatically different place. It's far fewer guards, far fewer doctors, far fewer prisoners, and, and certainly that smaller population is treated in a slightly different way than it, it would be managed when you know, that earlier that summer when there had been 30,000 people here. Between December 1864 and April of 1865, only 12,000 prisoners would be held captive inside the stockade of Andersonville. 
Of the 45,000 prisoners who walked through those wooden gates, over 13,000 did not live to walk out. In the 14 months of operation, only one liberation attempt was made by Sherman's army. Today, Camp Sumter Military Prison is a national historic site. Not only does it commemorate the soldiers who suffered and lost their lives some 150 years ago, but all prisoners of war throughout history. To think that these victims have people at home, mothers, wives, and sisters, who were thinking of them and would do much for them if they had the chance.